Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Welcome to the last Monday of 2025. I am at my sister's house visiting my, my mom. Actually, my sister is out of town, but we're watching their dogs. So if you hear barking and things like that, it's actually their dogs. We're looking after them while we're taking care of my mom. Anyway, I was looking at this post yesterday by Dr. Jim Fan, and I thought this was worth going over. I think this is a mostly excellent post. I have a few slightly different viewpoints on a few of these things, but of course he knows a lot more about this than I do. So in the end, he's more than likely right, but I thought I would at least Please go ahead and discuss this. Anyway, as Jim says, everyone's freaking out about vibe coding, which is really true. And that is going to be interesting in 2026, whether vibe coding really becomes the thing and everyone just vibe codes and the, the, the skill of coding actually goes away. There's an interesting post by Andre Carpathy where he talks about that as well. If you're interested in me doing a video about that specifically, let me know in the comments. I would love to know that. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video and subscribing, if you want to help me out going into 2026 and with my birthday coming soon, subscribing is the best thing you could do. I would would love to get to 100,000 subscribers because YouTube treats people very differently between 91,000 and 100,000 is a really different treatment. So if you want to help me out, give me an early birthday present, that would be fantastic. Anyway, Jim Fan's three lessons for 2025. Number one, hardware is ahead of software. Number two, benchmarking is still an epic disaster. And number three, VLM-based VLAs feel wrong. So I think the most interesting one is the third point, but I'll just read through the other ones here really quickly. So anyway, hardware is ahead of software. This is a bit of a surprise to me. I would think that software would be ahead of hardware. Hardware for humanoid robots and everything is very, very difficult. This is one of the places where I have a little differing point of view from Jim. I think because he leads Project Groot at NVIDIA, which if you don't know, it's creating a, a basically an entire ecosystem to build humanoid robots out of. I think he's so embedded in the software ends of things that he tends to see the software problems more than the hardware. So my personal opinion is that hardware is having, you know, it's difficult. They are obviously creating amazing stuff right now from Tesla, to figure to Aptronic and Chinese robots manufacturers. Lots and lots of folks are creating amazing stuff. But I would say it's it's fairly difficult still at this point. I don't think anybody has found the solution and it's not totally commoditized yet. But at least as he admits here, hardware reliability severely limits software iteration speed. We've seen exquisite engineering arts like Optimus. That's a very nice little thing. And Jim actually replied to Elon Musk at one point and said Optimus is an amazing work of art. So I guess he has seen it up close, probably closer than the rest of us. Anyway, E-Atlas, Figure, Neo, G1, etc. There are a lot of humanoid robots out there. Our best AI has not squeezed all of the juice out of these frontier hardware. Which is probably true, but I would say the opposite is probably true as well, that the hardware has not squeezed all the juice out of the software yet at this point either. But interestingly enough, and this again comes from someone who is way more into this than I am, and this is his daily job, the body is more capable than what the brain can command, yet babysitting these robots demands an entire operation team. And now if you can hear, you can hear the dogs down there. Unlike humans, robots don't heal from bruises. Overheating, broken motors, bizarre firmware issues haunt us daily. Mistakes are irreversible and unforgiving. My patience was the only thing that scaled this year. So I just want to call out this one line here that's highlighted in blue right now. Human beings are amazing. Like I just got back from the gym, right? I just broke down muscles. I damaged my body to some extent. And now over the next 24 hours or so, it's going to rebuild those muscles. It will fix the problems. All of that stuff is just done. There's a homeostasis that happens inside human beings that billions of years of evolution have led to. That doesn't happen with robots. If you overheat a motor, if you overstress it, if you damage it, if the robot falls over and breaks something, none of that stuff heals on its own. All of that stuff has to be taken care of by a team of humans dealing with that issue. So that leads to the unforgivingness of the hardware platform, which is why I said that I think that hardware is not maybe as far along as Jim said, and he said his patience was the only thing that scaled. So I think ultimately he realizes that too, but again, he knows better than I do, but it feels to me like neither the hardware nor the software at this point is, is, is real close to where it needs to go. Now, are they trending in the right direction? Yeah, of course they are, but both of them have a long way to go to get to that real level of perfection where everything can become commoditized and cheap and seem really, really easy. Now, this next one is really interesting. Benchmarking is still an epic disaster in robotics. That is very, very true. It's kind of true in large language models as well. People cherry pick the ones that look the best for them, but at least there's like a half dozen or 10 or so tests that people generally tend to agree on in terms of large language models. In other words, things like ChatGPT, Grok, etc. Whereas that is not at all the case for robotics at this point. So LLM, Normies, Thought, MMLU, and Sweebench are common sense. Hold your beer for robotics. No one agrees on anything. Hardware platform, task definition, scoring rubric, simulator, or real-world setups. Everyone is state-of-the-art by definition on the benchmark that they defined on the fly for each news announcement. 
Plus, everyone cherry picks the nicest looking demo out of 100 tries. We gotta do better as a field in 2026 and stop treating reproducibility and scientific discipline as second class citizens. So basically what he's saying here is that people are just creating whatever kind of benchmark they want to. There is no standard at this point. This is something that, that uh, Scott Walter and I talked about actually years ago. The idea that we had for the robot Olympics was not that there was like a sporting event or something where it's running the 50 meter dash or whatever, but that this would come out of an independent group. It would come out of a group group of companies and researchers and everything who would create a sort of benchmark system that you could then test your humanoid robot against and see how it stacked up to others. That was the idea. I mean, it is kind of like the Olympics, right? You're doing that with athletics. How fast can you run? Can you throw a javelin a certain distance? All that kind of stuff is a standardized metric for humans to judge each other and see who is the best. You can do the same thing with robotics. It doesn't have to be things like javelin throws. In fact, I hope it isn't because I don't know that I want humanoid robots throwing javelins, but I'm just saying like you could have things like them solving tasks like, you know, picking up stuff, picking up a coffee without spilling it, you know, doing threading needles, things like that. And of course, running and jumping and skills like that. But overall, we need an independent set of benchmarks. And that's what Jim Fan is calling for here. And I very much agree with that. And then we get to what I think is the most interesting part. VLM based VLA feels wrong. So VLA stands for vision language action. And that's a model that has been the dominant approach for robot brains. I, I don't think forever, maybe for the last eight or 10 years or something. I don't have a good sense of exactly when this started, but this is very much a deep neural network thing. This is not the PID sort of system or something from robots in the 90s and early 2000s. But anyway, within this, the recipe is simple, as he says. Take a pre-trained VLM checkpoint and graft an action model on top. So you're kind of plunking action, like the ability to do things in space on top of a VLM. But if you think about it, VLMs are hyper-optimized to hill climb benchmarks like visual question answering. So these vision language models are taught to, for example, recognize what is in this picture. Well, it's a robot who's thinking, it looks depressed. There's a, a kind of an urban landscape behind it that looks a little bit apocalyptic or something like that, right? This is what a VLM would be really good at doing. It's good at understanding a scene and figuring out what's going on in that scene. That's the hyper-optimization. But as Jim said, this has two problems with it. Number one, most parameters in VLMs are for language and knowledge, not for physics, and that's really important because robots, of course, are physical entities. And number two, visual encoders are actively tuned to discard low-level details. This is really interesting because Q&A only requires higher-level understanding, but minute details matter a lot for dexterity. So again, if we look at this image, the idea here is that you're going to take away, these VLMs will take away the, the, the sort of big picture thing, right? Robot thinking, looks depressed, post-apocalyptic landscape, urban, gray clouds, stuff like that. It might not notice the fact that there are only three fingers on this guy's hands here, and maybe maybe three on this side as well. It doesn't have four fingers. It also would not know how to negotiate or navigate this scene. That's not what a VLM is for. But a robot needs to recognize those minor details. It needs to be able to see a screw on the ground and then go down and pick up that screw and put it in the bin where it's supposed to be or something. That's not generalized understanding. That's hyper-specific understanding of things. And then the ability to move around in physical space and act on that. So as Jim says, there's no reason that VLA's performance will scale as VLM parameters scale. Pre-training is misaligned. In other words, it's not pre-training for the right thing. It's doing fine for the VLM. The VLM is doing what it's supposed to, but just grafting an action model on top of that misaligns the training of the model. And Jim suggests, and I completely agree with this, a video world model seems to be a much better pre-training objective for robot policy. I'm betting big on it. So clearly that's what they are working on over at Groot Labs at the moment. So what is a video world model? My understanding of that would be that you're taking videos, it's either from first person perspective like goggles or something like that, or potentially even VR stuff where you're actually inside the model and moving around. But the easiest way to do it is just things like YouTube videos or, you know, if somebody takes a video with their phone or something like that. If you can take a 2D video that somebody shoots and reconstruct a three-dimensional world out of it in very, very high detail, and even more than that, create a path planning algorithm or something where you can conceptualize your robot actually interacting with this world prior to it actually interacting interacting with it for real. That, if that works, unlocks the, the world of the internet, the internet levels of data. One of the big problems with robotics, which is implied here, but he doesn't actually say it, is that there's such a small amount of data because these robots, you either have to put a person in a full motion capture suit, a VR suit or something like that, and capture them painstakingly individually for every single task, and that's just one person. What if you want a thousand people to do that task so you have some sense of the differentiation between the different people? Well, that's almost impossible 
able to do at this point. Whereas if you can just take people's videos, people have, you know, terabytes, petabytes of videos of things interacting in the world, of just walking around in the world, doing videos, doing selfies, whatever that stuff is, you've got internet loads of data if you can do that. And my understanding here is that's what Jim is betting on. He's betting on a system of converting video, two-dimensional video information to a three-dimensional world that is physically accurate, that virtualized versions of these robots can interact with. That's the kind of Isaac Jim sort of situation. If you can make that transition from one to the other and create a physically accurate model of the world from 2D videos, that changes everything. And as Jim says here in the last sentence, I'm betting big on it. So that looks like that's what 2026 is. It will be interesting to come back and see how they're doing in another year, whether that actually pans out or whether it had to be another method that worked well, or even worse than that, that nothing has worked well and nobody knows exactly how to solve the problem. So it'll be really interesting to see what 2026 brings. I, for one, am very much looking forward to it. Alrighty, folks, that's what I've got for you today. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this while you're down there. Like I said, if you don't mind liking the video, it really helps things out. And if you want to give me an early birthday present and a 2026 present, please consider subscribing and check to make sure you're still subscribed and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.